So in this video, we have the evolution unit and learning targets 18 through 21 concerning patterns in evolution. And so in this video, we're going to look at some different patterns of evolution. And then we're also going to look at the history of the earth and how things have changed from the beginning to current time. And so one co concept that we've already talked about and learned about is the concept of convergent evolution. And this is when organisms share common traits, though they may not share recent common ancestry. And this is due to organisms adapting to similar environments and they'll share similar traits. Remember, this is like analogous structures, regardless of their ancestry. And so here we have fish, we have early reptiles and the ichthyosaur, we have dolphins, all animals that developed fins, but all very distantly related as far as uh, evolutionary history is concerned. But again, all very similar structures because of similar selection pressures in the ocean. The opposite of that is divergent evolution. And this is when many organisms share a one common ancestor. And so we have many mammals today, and here are some fantastic drawings of four mammals, the giraffe, the cow, the jaguar, and the armadillo, four I would have chosen. And these all very different in structure, are very different in function and the way they live. However, all share very similar structures, very similar commonalities because they share a, a one common ancestor, some ancestral mammal that lived long ago. Another name for this idea, idea of adaptive or of divergent evolution is the concept of adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation usually follows some sort of mass extinction and think about a mass extinction, uh, lots of organisms die, and there's lots of niches available, lots of roles that are available to be filled. And populations will change over time to fill those roles. Take, for instance, Darwin's finches. Galapagos Islands are constantly changing. They're forming and unforming constantly. And so over time, these finches have also changed, eating lots of different things, whereas you have some finches that eat fruit, others that eat seeds and cactuses, and you even have a finch that eats blood of another bird. They, they are, have evolved over time in order to fit the needs of their environment. And another example, after the Mesozoic period, which we're going to look at, mammals evolved to fill the roles that were the dinosaurs left vacant. And so that's why you see mammals being the kings of the earth today as opposed to T-Rex and his friends. And so next is the concept of coevolution. This is when two species change together in order to match each other's adaptation. Now it's not like they have a plan to do this, um, but when one evolves, the other kind of evolves to match. An example is in this picture, there's a moth called the giant sphinx moth, and it has an adaptation, this giant long proboscis, which is just another fancy name for a mouth, and it has this giant mouth in order to pollinate a particular kind of plant called the ghost orchid, which has evolved this very long nectar spur which is where the nectar is housed. There's only one animal on Earth that can pollinate that plant, and that's this giant sphinx moth, uh, giant sphinx moth. And there's only one uh, animal that can eat this from this flower, and it's this one. And so together, they've kind of evolved to where they benefit one another. Another example would be just real simple. Think of the hawk. And the, and the mouse. Well, hawks have very good eyesight. In turn, mice have very good camouflage. And as a mouse's camouflage gets better in successive generations, so you would expect the hawk's eyesight to get better. 
And so this is another example of predator-prey coevolution. The fastest animal in the world is a cheetah. Guess what it eats? The second fastest animal in the world. And so these two animals, again, have co-evolved in order to match one another. And so that leads us to talk about extinction. Extinction is when a species is no longer living in the wild. There are different kinds of extinctions to talk about. The dodo bird there is kind of the, the poster boy for extinction. Dodos uh, lived on an island kind of uh, off to itself and didn't have any interactions with people. And their first interactions with people were bad ones. And they soon went extinct. Um, there are two different kinds of extinction we'll look at. First is ecological extinction. This is what we normally see. And this is when a species is living, but its population is so small that its number is no longer, it's no longer significantly, uh, it's no longer significantly attributing or um, contributing to its community, meaning that it no longer has a place on the food web. It's no longer eating and being eaten. It's no longer gaining energy and giving energy. And so in this case, this species, because it's no longer interacting with its community, is no longer going to change. And a species that's not changing over time will die out eventually as the environment changes. And so the community can be damaged by this as well because a significant piece of the community has gone away. Here's a picture of the of the golden toad, which is thought to be extinct. They haven't been seen for probably 20 years now. Um, and, you know, they say things go extinct all the time, then they go find one. But uh, golden toads are probably extinct because of the destruction of the rainforest. The rainforest was destroyed or had, has been being destroyed and the golden toad could not keep up, population got real small, was no longer able to change to adapt, and died out. And that's different from mass extinction. Mass extinction is when some sort of event causes the worldwide extinction of many species. So here you, show, you see the dinosaurs, uh, they are thought to have been gone extinct from meteor uh, that struck the earth. Um, and you always see the picture of the T-Rex kind of shouting in disgust of the oncoming meteor onslaught. Um, it's thought that we're currently living in a mass extinction period where the humans are the cause of the mass extinction that's going on now. Um, and so we're going to look at several mass extinctions that possibly happen in our Earth's history. And it kind of leads us to looking at the rate of evolutionary change because there are two primary ideas as to how uh, evolution occurs. The first is called gradualism. This is where you have a gradual change over time in a population, slow and steady accumulation of genetic changes over time leads to these bigger changes and you kind of see this here where these very subtle changes over time lead to bigger changes and so this is one model of how evolution is thought to occur called gradualism. Very easy to think about that word. Well, another idea is called catastrophism. And you think of the word catastrophe. This is the idea that changes occur very rapidly due to some sort of large-scale extinction event, like an asteroid or a global flood. This doesn't require massive amounts of time. Well, a commonality or a kind of a compromise between these two views is what is most commonly accepted in biology or biology today called punctuated equilibrium. And this is where evolution occurs with long periods of stasis or long periods of equilibrium, like you see here, these long periods of, of no change, followed by these short quick periods of change, this punctuated part, um, usually because of some massive event. And so here you kind of have a blend between this catastrophism and gradualism called punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated because you have these short periods of time followed by long periods of equilibrium where no change is occurring. And so now looking at Earth's timeline, 
over the past 700 million years, which is where kind of where life is thought to be. We're going to look at Precambrian time, and these are just the names of eras. Uh, Precambrian, um, the Precambrian era is kind of before what we would think of like um, way before history, way before fossils even, and Precambrian time is mostly unicellular type organisms eventually developing into like multicellular organisms um, several hundred million years ago the organisms were soft bodied so very few fossils exist from this time and the idea is is that at some point in Precambrian time the earth became very cold so cold in fact that it froze almost completely over except for very small pockets in the deepest parts of the ocean where it was still warm near the you know near the mantle essentially and here you have these concentrations of this life that is left over and so again very long periods of stasis followed by these short punctuated times and so after snowball earth you have what's called the Paleozoic era and what begins with called the Cambrian explosion. This Cambrian time is, is part of the Paleozoic era and this is where life began to fill all the niches that were available because of Snowball Earth. And so here you have the first big multicellular organisms like fish that are going to uh, begin inhabiting the Earth. And so the the Devonian epoch or the Devonian time is often called the age of fish. You can kind of see this on here. I don't know if you can see Devonian. Yeah, there it is. The age of fish. These are periods, actually not epochs. And so you have the Cambrian period followed by these other two that I don't know. And then you have the Devonian period, which this is the age of fish and so all these fish start to come on the earth and then followed by fish you have amphibians the first vertebrates that start to walk on the land well while this is going on the earth is kind of meandering and changing plate tectonics are occurring well here's some of the first amphibians by the way I didn't want to leave them out there they are and then you have this giant structure all the continents kind of combined together with one giant ocean and this giant continent is called Pangaea. Well Pangaea has causes the mass extinction of many species because what you have in the middle of Pangaea is these giant deserts, these wastelands, vast wasteland where nothing can live and so all these amphibians that have evolved in the um, Paleozoic era are going to begin to go extinct and leave all these niches open and we need some sort of animal that can inhabit the land and the dry places of the earth and so what's going to happen? Reptiles are going to come on the scene and this is where you have the Mesozoic era and so again these eras are separated by different geolo or different mass extinctions and so reptiles inhabit the earth other animals that can live off that water, mammals are going to come around during this time. Dinosaurs populate the earth. There's some of our friends, the dinosaurs. Here's some more. They all kind of got together for a photo op. And then down here, you'll notice the little rat-like ancestral mammal. And what follows? The impact theory. And so down here, of course, the T-Rexes are shouting in disgust, you know, stop it, or no, they don't like the uh, the oncoming onslaught. However, this imp this extinction level event that happens as a result of this impact likely ended the time <coughs> that dinosaurs were prevalent on the Earth. Most most species are going to go extinct. Lots of open niches, and this leads to the Cenozoic era, which is the age of mammals. Still have reptiles, still have fish, still have amphibians, all these things, but now mammals 
are going to rule the earth and they're going to fill all these niches that were left open by reptiles large mammals large predatory birds actually are going to come about during this time and then a later Cenozoic period which we're in now have been for like the last several hundred thousand years when this, this later period you're going to have these funny shaped people called humans primates are going to come around and then these first ancestors of human beings begin to populate the earth and of course humans uh, the rest is history we we uh, chase all the mammoths off the cliff uh, as you see in this picture and we end up taking over the world and writing about all this stuff and so you can see the change over time and the different patterns in evolution have largely been shaped based on what's going on on the earth and so who knows what's going to happen uh, with our next massive extinction and who knows when that's going to happen but when it does happen it will likely change and it will likely cause massive changes to the life on earth